Welcome to Contemplating Christmas 2022. My name is Liz Mullins and my reflections here are focused on themes of darkness and light. To begin, I would ask that you bless us, Lord, with vision. May this space be a sacred place where heaven and earth meet. Amen. So the first of these reflections comes from Genesis 1. It's about the creation. So, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. The earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Darkness is the direct opposite of lightness. It's defined as a lack of illumination, an absence of visible light, or a surface that absorbs light, such as black or brown. Colour is important to most people, but human vision is unable to distinguish colours in the dark. This is because the hugely sensitive photoreceptor cells on the retina are inactive when light levels are low. Darkness often generates an emotional response. It may be something of wonder and awe as we look at a night sky and all its stars, but it's all often a feeling of foreboding, fear or unhappiness. Darkness has also been associated with mental illness. Depression, for example, has been described as a black dog. And although that expression is associated with Winston Churchill. The term was actually coined by the Roman poet Horace. It describes depression as being followed by a dark shadow. Darkness is a constant in horror films. In TV or movie thrillers, something terrible often happens in the dark. Viewers can only catch a glimpse of the action and accompanied inevitably by music designed to ramp up the tension. Well, I don't really like watching that sort of thing. Quite apart from my dislike of violence, I prefer my viewing to be full of light and colour. Darkness is associated with the unknown, with things to be fearful of, with uncertainty. In the dead of night, in the dark of night, when our imaginations run wild, we think of the worst possible outcomes as we toss and turn, trying to sleep. When they were young, one of my children's favourite books was Where the Wild Things Are. It was a tale of a boy called Max, who journeyed into darkness where things were scary, even though he had a nice time in the end. So it goes, and when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws till Max said, be still, and tamed them with the magic trick of staring into all their yellow eyes without blinking once. And they were frightened and called him the most wild thing of all and made him king of all wild things. And now, cried Max, let the wild rumpers start. Now stop, said Max, and sent the wild things off to bed without their supper. And Max, the king of all wild things, was lonely and wanted to be where someone loved him best of all. And Max came out of the darkness into the light, where everything was safe and familiar, and his supper was waiting for him. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. 
when God created light, that light was good. It provides clarity when there's light. And when there's light, we can see colour, we can feel its energy. After the great flood, God produced a rainbow full of light and colour. This was a sign of the covenant that he would never again destroy all life with floodwaters. It serves as a reminder of God's forgiveness, truthfulness, and that however great the trials that we endure, God will remain faithful and good. And you know, it's not just Christians who celebrate the light. One of the most important festivals in Hinduism is Diwali, or the Festival of Lights. It symbolises the spiritual victory of light over darkness, good over evil and knowledge over ignorance. It's celebrated with lights, with fireworks, with the sharing of food and sweets and giving of gifts and offering of prayers. Not unlike our Christian celebration of Christmas, I might suggest. So God didn't abolish darkness at creation. God added light. For many, darkness symbolises all that is negative, harmful, evil and fearful. God gave equal importance and prominence to darkness and light. And let's remember that all life, including human life, begins and develops in the dark, in the womb. It's just as we hear in the story of creation. So in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind swept over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. As we sit quietly now to meditate on this passage of scripture about darkness and light, here's one thing to think about. Why is it that the darkness around Christmas time often brings a different kind of feeling? One of warmth and a feeling of well-being or excitement? Is it the lights which twinkle on the tree or in our streets? What is it that makes Christmas such a special time of year? The second of these reflections comes from the second chapter of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel. It's about the visit of the wise men. So in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and we've come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is the Messiah? Where was the Messiah to be born? They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it's been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me words so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, 
they left for their own country by another road. They're in the dark. The wise men, I mean. They had been following a star. They knew they were looking for a king, but they really were in the dark. They'd come from the east looking for a king. But they didn't know the nature of that king. They were in the dark. Ignorant of the king they were about to pay homage to. Uninformed. They had no idea who they would encounter when the star stopped over a stable. We don't know whether the Star of Bethlehem was an actual star. There have been numerous explanations. Some scholars see the nativity stories, including the star, as fiction. The only one of the Gospels which includes the star is Matthew, and the accounts of the nativity in Matthew and Luke aren't always consistent. Oregon, an influential early theologian, connected the star to the fulfilment of a prophecy. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the borderlands of Moab and the territory of all the Shephites. That's from Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Oregon suggested that the Magi may have decided to travel to Jerusalem when they conjectured that the man whose appearance had been foretold, along with that of the star, had actually come into the world. John Chrysostom, another early theologian, didn't agree. He thought the star was simply a miracle. How, tell me, did the star point out a spot so confined, just the space of a manger and shed, unless it left that height and came down and stood over the very head of the young child? And at this the evangelist, Matthew, was hinting when he said, Lo, the star went before him, until it came and stood over where the young child was. Other explanations for the star of Bethlehem involve astronomical objects, a planetary conjunction, a double occultation, whatever that is, helical rising, maybe even a comet or a supernova. But whatever the truth of what the star actually was, it doesn't matter. That star was a light that the Magi had followed all the way from the east. It was a light which guided, a light which filled them with joy. The gifts they brought of gold, frankincense and myrrh had a special meaning. Gold for a king on earth, frankincense for a deity, and myrrh used in rituals around death, prefiguring Jesus' death on a cross. Perhaps the Magi weren't that much in the dark after all. They'd certainly brought some pretty special gifts with them. So King Herod, his scribes and Pharisees were also in the dark. They didn't know what sort of king the Magi were looking for. A rival king wasn't something they were aware of or wanted. Herod's power was fragile. His hold on that power was dependent on the Romans and he was expected to act in their interests. It's not surprising that Herod was frightened. He certainly felt threatened. These were violent times. One of Herod's brothers was poisoned, another killed during a revolt. Herod himself executed his wife Mariam because he believed that she had committed adultery and was trying to kill him. In this world into which Jesus was born, fear and turmoil were all around. You know, the best form of defence is to attack. They were indeed dark times. And into this darkness, Jesus was born in a stable, visited by kings bearing royal gifts, his birth heralded by angels, with a light of a great star pointing the way. It's not surprising that Herod wanted him gone. Another king who might threaten his power had to be destroyed. And if it took the deaths of all the infant boys, so be it. In truth, no one knows whether the massacre of the innocents actually happened. 
and Herod ruled for a long time and was a great builder of temples. But the point remains. In troubled times, with political instability, leaders want to hold on to power, but the people just want peace. So the wise men were wise. They were no longer in the dark. They'd seen the light and didn't do what Herod had demanded. They quietly slipped away. So my final reflection is from the Gospel of John. When we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, this life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and that in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we were walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's a bit chunky. But it's, it's good. So I've been watching Strictly. I watch it every year. I love the spangles and the glitter. I love watching the celebrities grow and develop until they're indistinguishable from the professionals and the actual dancing is fabulous. As I wrote this piece, Strictly had just been to Blackpool. It was all very glamorous as usual and hugely enjoyable with the dancers rightly getting great scores from the judges. Blackpool is famous as a seaside resort but it's also home to the Illuminations. This is an annual lights festival held every year since 1879. They run from late August till early November, stretching over six miles along the promenade and using over a million light bulbs. If we want to talk about light things, even Strictly doesn't get much sparklier than that. But, Behind the seaside crowds and kiss-me-quick hats and the sticks of rock and the illuminations, Blackpool is a very dark place. In England, there are 317 local authority areas and in 2019, Blackpool was ranked as the most deprived across any number of indices you want to look at. Behind the glitter and the glitz, there's huge poverty and huge struggles which we don't see when we watch Strictly or are dazzled by the light of the illuminations. Ah, Strictly. As usual, this year I didn't have a clue who any of the celebrities was. It doesn't matter as week by week we get to know them as we watch them dance. Well, this year, one of them was an actor called Will Meller, famous for a TV series called Two Pints of Lager and a Packet of Crisps. This ran for 10 years or so from the early noughties and it passed me by completely. It's centred around the lives of a group of 20-something friends and was set in the town of Runcorn in Cheshire. Runcorn is one of the most deprived towns in England 
And in the 1980s, I lived in the most deprived housing estate in Brancorn, where my then husband was curate. People there had nothing. I was once in a chippy and a woman with a small child ordered a bag of chips. She looked in her purse and said, oh, I'll make that too. It was obvious that the bag of ch chips was going to be dinner. And then she realised she had enough money for a bag each. It was well known but unspoken that when food was short, mums would eat laundry starch to fill themselves up. One of the church wardens, when things were really tough, would head to the Liverpool docks. Nobody judged her. In many ways, this was a very dark place. A lot of crime, a lot of burglaries. I learnt that poor people steal from other poor people. Not much sign of walking in fellowship here, at least on the surface. That wasn't quite right, though. It wasn't all darkness in Runcorn. The church, for one thing, was thriving. It was a place of support and fellowship. One of the church wardens was unable to read, but was a huge support to the church and the people there, and in the wider community where he served on the local council. In one instance, the ladies who ran the Sunday school wanted a new banner. This was the 1980s and these things were still sort of pretty important. So they spent a year fundraising enthusiastically and finally went off in great excitement to the banner people. They were bitterly disappointed. All that fundraising didn't get them anywhere near enough money. But it turned out that this was a group of expert sewers. And with a bit of encouragement, they used some of the money to make the banner themselves. And I don't know, triumph came out of tragedy. They came back from the Deanery Sunday School Festival delighted at an overheard bitchy comment. Oh, you can tell when someone's had their banner professionally made. You know, this church is still going strong today. It's still at the heart of the community donating toys for those who can't afford Christmas presents, making the church garden beautiful, helping people find accommodation. They just provide a hot chocolate and sweets to 150 kids and their parents at Halloween. And they're continuing to preach and teach the gospel through all of that. There are so many things in this world which are bad, which are broken, which are evil, dark, if we go along with them, we'll stay in darkness. But if we believe that God is light, God is life, if we accept that we are broken, that we are sinful, that we were wrong and need forgiveness, God will walk beside us into the light, keeping us safe and in fellowship with him, walking in the light. In Runcorn and similar communities across Across the country, the light of Christ shines in fellowship and people are confident that they are indeed walking with God, even in tough times. So in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good.